veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. That's the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ taking on humanity. The message for today, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. And for those of you who came in a little bit late, you may not have yet noticed the reason that there are no cushions in any of the side pews is because the central pews were padded this week. Three inches of soft foam and one on the back. And we hope that you enjoy that. It's a Christmas surprise from your trustees. Uh, the grace of God has provided that. And so uh, if you want to move over there where it's a little more comfortable, feel free to do so at this time. And uh, encourage everyone else to as well. Our text for today was Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And the key verse is Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's an amazing thought. Not part of it. Jesus is not part God. Jesus is fully God. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power and for its declaration expressed in so many of the Christmas carols concerning what the incarnation is really about. God, the fullness of the Godhead bodily coming to earth that he might himself pay the penalty for our sins and reconcile us to God. Bring us back into fellowship with you, we who were cursed and damned to hell. And yet Jesus became man that he might die for us and pay the full penalty for our sins. Be buried and rise from the dead, proving that his guarantee, his promise of eternal life is true for all those who place their faith in him. Help us, Father, to fall in adoration and worship before his feet, for he is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us unto God by his blood, the blood of the Incarnation, to receive honor and glory and power and riches and blessing. We do not deserve it, Father, but we thank you for it. For we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, God incarnate, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, at Christmas time, we usually focus on the Christmas narrative that's found in the Synoptic Gospels, particularly the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Mark omits the birth account, but John actually gives a birth account from a different perspective. Did you ever stop and think about that? We all know the shepherds in Luke. We all, all know the wise men in Matthew. But did you ever stop to think that John also gives a birth account, but from a different perspective? The perspective eternity past. And that's the way he begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So we're going all the way back to eternity past when we begin here. All things were made by him, so it brings us down to creation. And without him was not anything made that was made. Eternity passed to creation. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. God creating life on earth, not merely creating things. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then he goes to the forerunner, also mentioned by Luke. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The world was made by him. He was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, I want you to listen carefully to verses 13 and 14, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you see the two things that John has juxtaposed there in those two verses? 
Just like the virgin birth of Christ was unique, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, as the virgin birth of Christ was unique and impossible with men, so the new birth is unique and impossible with men, which were born not of blood. That's as many as believe on his name. That's what it's talking about in verse 12. And it goes on, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Just as the virgin birth of Christ was unique and impossible with men, so the new birth is unique and impossible with men. And that's the comparison that John makes when speaking of the birth of our Savior. And he goes on in verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Again, taking us back to eternity past. The one who is God. And of his fullness, huh? in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John suddenly takes us over to what Paul speaks of in Colossians 2.9, which is our text for today. Of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Do you understand how large a gift it is that God has given to us when he sent his Son into the world? to die in our place. Of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to redeem them that were under the law. The law was given by Moses. If you and I were still under the law, we'd still be under the curse. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And then one of the main purposes of the incarnation. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That's our Savior. That's the one that we celebrate at Christmas. That's the one who has come into the world. He has declared the Father unto us in human flesh. In the Old Testament, God revealed to Job that there would be a kinsman redeemer who would guarantee our resurrection when he appeared. His birth would herald his death and his resurrection. Job writes in Job 19, verse 23, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. God revealed to Job through special revelation that there would be a redeemer, a goel, a kinsman redeemer, and in the last days, when Job was on the earth, he would stand on the earth and Job would see him. But as John has told us, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath revealed him. The scripture is covered with great and precious promises, prophecies and fulfillments of God come in the flesh, where the fullness of the Godhead is manifested and revealed in him. How is that possible? Of course, only God himself could do what Job prophesied. God himself would have to come in the flesh because otherwise we would not be able to see him or experience him in a tangible way. And Paul makes reference to that also in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. He's speaking of the Father. You and I will never see the Father, but the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly reveals and manifests to us who the Father is. Jesus said, Philip, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Dear people, that's our Lord. That's who we celebrate at Christmas time. The angel explained it to the Virgin Mary. 
as to how this would be possible. In Luke chapter 1, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Since God himself was going to appear in human flesh, God himself appearing in human flesh, think about that. God arranged the order of world events to comply with his plan. The world didn't know it. Caesar didn't know that it was the hand of God who moved him to call for this census where everyone would have to go back to their, their hometown. God moved the hearts of leaders. God moved massive groups of people. God's still doing it today. As you look at the world scenario around you, there are people out there who are afraid. There are people who are troubled. But we as believers can rest in the confidence that we have a sovereign God who works not merely in little tiny locales. There went a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. <laughs> the Roman Empire covered most of the known world at that time. God is still in the business of moving nations, of moving planet Earth and shaking planet Earth to guarantee the accomplishment of his purpose because it is centered in Jesus Christ. And even as he moved the world in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ at his birth, so he will move the world in the days leading up to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The incarnation, as we mentioned just a few moments ago, the Incarnation is a key theme of the doctrinal epistles. Oh yes, we see extended narratives here in the Gospels, but did you know how many times it occurs in the doctrinal epistles? I'll read you just a few of them. How about Romans chapter 1? It's the one of the two places where we have the Gospel in the nutshell. Romans 1, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Those give to us the Gospel, the good news by which we are saved. And Paul begins the epistle to the Romans, one of the most powerful doctrinal epistles in the New Testament, with a declaration of the Incarnation. Did you know that? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised to fore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Now listen to the next phrase, because this is the Incarnation which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Paul states that the gospel includes the incarnation, who Jesus is and what he did. God is our Savior, but he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power. Here's the proof of it according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. John speaks of it in 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. So he takes us back to eternity past, just like he did in 
his gospel, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. There is the incarnation. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. That's the incarnation. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You can't see God the Father, so God revealed him through the Son. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. He speaks of the Incarnation three chapters later in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. People who deny the Incarnation are antichrists. Hereby you know the Spirit of God, the Spirit of every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is it already in the world. Four verses in that tiny little epistle of John that tell us why the Incarnation is important. It's central to the declaration of who Jesus Christ is and what he did. He is God come in the flesh. Oh, there are those liberals out there who think that, and they teach, and they've been doing this since the 20s, that Jesus Christ is uh, merely an illegitimate child of a Roman soldier who had an affair with, with the Virgin Mary. There are those who teach that Jesus Christ is uh, really not God in the flesh, he is some kind of an archangel. He's some kind of a phantasm. Many, many of the cults fall into that category. Paul goes on in Philippians chapter 2, we find again a statement of the incarnation. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he starts out by telling you Jesus Christ is God. That's where he started out. Eternity past, the form of God. Eternity past, equal with God. Now, it's blasphemy to say that about anybody who is not, in fact, God. But listen to verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. That's the incarnation. That's God coming in the flesh. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, here we find the purpose why Jesus had to become a man, why God had to come in the flesh. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, the Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus Christ could have come in the flesh, and then, rather than going to the cross, ascended back to heaven. Or, as he said when they were about to arrest him, and the disciples were all up in arms and going to try to defend him, he said, do you not think that I can at this very moment call for 12 legions of angels? A legion is between 6,000 and 12,000. Jesus could have called for 144,000 angels if he wanted. Do you think if he had done that, that they might have been able to beat that paltry little group of rabble soldiers that came sneaking out into the garden that night. Do you think the angels could have beat them? Yes, they could have. But if they had, you and I would still be on our way to hell. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is, back to that same theme where we started, he's not merely our Savior, but he's our Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is co-equal with the Father. But you can't see the Father. And so Jesus Christ came to earth to reveal who the Father is, what he is like, so that you would understand, so that you and I both could understand the character of God himself. Dear people, that's what Christmas is about. That's what Christmas is about. I suspect in this last week you've probably done some last minute shopping, running around, buying things for people you love, and you've been to the stores where the Santa Claus is sitting up there and holding little kids on his lap, and Christmas trees scattered all around, and people busy buying, and probably walking out with cartloads of wine and other liquor, and <laughs> they're missing it. They're missing it. Perhaps even we have missed what it's all about. Why do we give at Christmas? Because gifts, giving gifts is an expression of love. It's a reflection of what Christmas is really about. It's not just the spirit of Christmas, generic, of everybody being nice. I, I got a, an email from uh, one of my high school classmates. And um, it was linked to all of the guys who were in my graduating high school class from Stony Brook. And a whole bunch of them responded to it with, yeah, this is a, a great season for tolerance and uh, oh, some of the most pathetic things you ever read in your life. I just thought, you went to a Christian high school and you don't know any better than that? You don't understand what Christmas is all about? It's not just about tolerance of uh, people of color and gays uh, and uh, Muslims. They were on there talking about how we need to be tolerant of the Muslims. <laughs> Bizarre. Is that what Christmas is about? Is it? No, Christmas is about God sending his son into the world, giving the greatest gift of all, that he might die for sinners. They're going on and on about, well, the angels talked about peace, and so we should really try to live at peace. We will never bring peace. Only Jesus can bring peace. He is the Prince of Peace, and this earth will continue its downward plunge until it crashes and burns no matter how many crazy humanitarians there are out there who think that they can, in their human strength, bring peace. The Antichrist will promise peace. People will flock to him because he will use the strong arm to bring peace and set himself up in a temple in Jerusalem and declare that he is God. Dear people, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. And he does not have tolerance with sin and evil. That is not the way to bring peace. Sorry, I've gotten off to preaching instead of giving you the message for this morning. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And someday every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, even those who don't do it now. We either do it willingly and voluntarily. He is the Lord who came to earth, the Lord of heaven, at his birth. Either we do it voluntarily now, or someday God will break the knees of everybody on planet earth and smash their faces into the ground and say, you will bow. The book of Hebrews speaks of the Incarnation in a very beautiful way. It describes for us one of the reasons why Jesus became incarnate. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That, beloved, is the Incarnation. We see Paul speaking of him in Romans as the seed of David in Romans chapter 1, the incarnation. Here Paul speaking in the book of Hebrews says, He took not on him the nature of angels, which disproves all those who say that he is Michael the archangel. He took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Dear friends, that was prophesied 2,000 years before Jesus was born because the fullness of time had not yet come. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Made of a woman, 
the virgin birth. The incarnation was by the virgin birth, emphasized in the epistles. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That's one of the reasons for the incarnation, that he would be our brother, that he might be our kinsman redeemer. It was the brother who was the kinsman redeemer. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. We needed one who was not only our brother, but we needed one who would make intercession to God for us. The prophet spoke the word of God to the people. The priest presented the people to God. And we needed a faithful and merciful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He had to be a man to shed his blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Another of the purposes of the incarnation. We can see as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4, where he is faced with the great temptations that Satan brings before him. All of which are designed to avoid the cross. All of which are designed for Jesus to be able to take the kingdom now. We all want it here and now kind of stuff. You see everything out there, Jesus? Right now I'm in control of that, says the devil. When Adam fell, I got it. God made him the, to have dominion over this, but then he obeyed me. And when you obey somebody, he's over you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me and I'll give it to you. All of it. All of it. You can have your kingdom now. You won't have to go to the cross. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only, and him shalt thou serve. The incarnation, people. The battle of the incarnation. There's a huge war that goes on, a spiritual conflict that goes on from, from the birth of Christ and the murder of the innocents by Herod, all the way until finally Satan thinks he has won. And all of his henchmen here on earth gleefully surround the cross. And he claimed to be the Christ. If he's the Christ of God, let him come down from the cross now and we'll believe him. Oh, the smiting, the scorning, the spitting, the mockery could not have taken place but for the incarnation. And he did it for me. Can you say that about yourself? He did it for me. There are many reasons and practical things that God wanted to accomplish at the Incarnation. That first one is what we saw this morning in Colossians 2.9, to manifest his own fullness. God manifested his own fullness in Christ. Not just part, his fullness. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You want to see what the fruit of the Spirit is like? Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ manifests with the, what the, the Spirit is like. You want to see what the Father is like? Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath revealed Him. Do you want to know what the Godhead is like? Look at Jesus. The second, oh, how we thank God for this one. The second practical reason that Jesus Christ came in the flesh was to destroy the devil and his works. I read you verses 11, 12, and 13 a moment ago out of Hebrews chapter 2. Now let me read you the next two verses, verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same. That is the incarnation. We all partake of flesh and blood. Likewise, he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the, the one of whom the passage is speaking. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that is of flesh and blood. Listen to the next phrase. That through death 
he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Huh. The Incarnation had as one of its key purposes destroying Satan and his kingdom. Destroying the one who had the power of death by his resurrection. If Jesus had not died, he could not have risen. By his death, he overcame death. By his death and resurrection, he destroyed the devil. Listen to the next verse. Here's another one of the practical applications of the incarnation. And deliver them, that's us, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, if, if you look at a lot of the advertisements, especially advertisements that deal with medicine and advertisements that deal with health products and all that other stuff, what are they trying to say to you? Sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly. If you will just buy our product, you can postpone death. And the world goes after it like crazy. They love those things because they think, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Hey, I'll be glad when the Lord takes me home. I'm not looking for it. I'm not planning to, to try to hasten it on. I try to do things that are healthy and wise because God has given me a ministry here. God reminds me every now and then that it can happen at any time. Like I told you about that trip down to Alabama where my I drove a thousand miles with nearly 14,000 pounds of vehicle, both what I was driving and what I had in tow. Brakes were acting funny, went into the shop. The mechanic drove that vehicle into the shop at maybe three or four miles an hour and right above the lift put on the brakes and the brake line burst. If that had happened while I was driving at 70 miles an hour, and yes, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour in the south, <laughs> I would be in heaven. Just a reminder, if God wants to take you today, he can take you today. For the believer who really understands and believes there is no longer a fear of death. No longer a fear of death. Because we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the world around us is terrified of death. But Jesus came in flesh and blood so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Another one of the great reasons for the Incarnation is that God would provide His Son as the Bridegroom and provide a bride for His Son. When you read the book of Revelation, and Jesus talked about it in the parable of the, of the Bridegroom and the wise virgins and the foolish virgins and so on, and He, he spoke of why His disciples did not fast, because how can they fast when the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when they will fast. But right now, he says, they, they don't fast because the heavenly bridegroom is here. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for husband. The scripture speaks of the wedding feast of the Lamb. And you and I are part of the bride that Christ has redeemed. To be able to do that, to win his bride, he had to go into mortal combat for her. Only a few men, today at least, are willing to die for the ones they love. America is filled with wimps who pass the buck and let somebody else do it. Because they don't understand love. They don't understand that love means sacrifice. They don't understand that love means giving, like God gave at Christmas. He gave his son to die. Dear people, the sacrifice of love to provide a bride for his son. 
Paul also gives another reason for the incarnation in Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, but what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is also the same that ascended far above all heavens. He that descended. What is that phrase referring to? The incarnation. You see, it is foundational to so many doctrines in Scripture. He that descended is the same also that ascended far up above all, heaven, uh, all heavens, that he might fill all things. Not merely fulfill, but fill all the voids, all the cracks, all the gaps, all the places where God's plan had been marred and clawed by Satan and by sin. He filled it in and he cleansed it out and he smoothed it over. And in the end, he presents to God that which is perfect. That's our Lord. Another of the reasons for the incarnation the fullness of the Godhead bodily, why is he revealing the Father, is to manifest his glory. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I wish I could read all the places, and our time is running out, I wish I could read all the places in the New Testament in the doctrinal epistles where the incarnation is foundational to the key doctrines that Paul and Peter and John and Jude are teaching. Dear ones, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Another of the great reasons for the incarnation was to manifest the love of the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He, Jesus, manifests the love of of the Father. He makes it visible. He makes it tangible. He makes it understandable. He makes it personal. He makes it practical. Jesus manifests the love of the Father. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, Colossians 2, verses 6 and following, so walk ye in him. He's manifested the love of the Father. How are you going to respond? These are the verses, the three verses that lead up to our key text for today. He has manifested the love of the Father. How are you going to respond to him? Paul tells you how you and I must respond. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, not merely the Savior, Christ Jesus the Lord, how has it changed your life? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Being a Christian, being truly saved, is transformational. He goes on and explains rooted. You've got to put down roots because if you don't have any roots, it's all over. That which has no roots withers up and dries away and built up in him. There's that picture of building on a firm foundation, another foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Built up in him and established in the faith. There is doctrinal content, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. How are you walking? How are you living? How are you abounding with thanksgiving? How are you established in the faith as you have been taught? You have been taught here. Some of you for many, 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 many years. How has it changed your life? But there's an attack, just like there was against Jesus. That's verse 8, right before our key verse. Beware lest any man spoil you. Oh, Satan attacked 
He tried to turn aside God's plan. Beware lest any man spoil you. Jesus was God. His divine nature welded to his human nature, one person, two natures, forever the indissolvable God-man. Satan could attack all he wants, but he would never fall, but you and I can fall. So you need to go back to foundations. You need to go back to roots. You need to go back to what you've been taught. You need to go back to what you've been built up in. And you begin to walk in it. But when you're walking, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's treachery and trickery. After the tradition of men. Look around you this Christmas season. Do you see some traditions of men? As you wander through the mall, do you see some traditions of men? As you get invitations to Christmas parties, do you see some traditions of men? After the vain traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Remember the focus of Christmas. It may be a trite saying, but it certainly is true. Jesus is the reason for the season. Keep Christ in Christmas. There's a reason that those little pithy sayings have been penned by someone anonymous. We know not who or how long ago, but someone started those two somewhere because they saw that the world had forgotten Jesus. They saw the world had forgotten the reason for the incarnation after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And here is the reason, our key verse for today. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes, he's the one who reveals the Father. Creation reveals the Father. Paul explains that in Romans 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Yes, creation does to a very limited extent reveal God. But the greatest revelation of all is in Jesus Christ at the Incarnation, which is what Christmas is all about. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. And now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we praise you and thank you for the incarnation. We use the theological terms flippantly. We say, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that guy is uh, doctrinally sound. And then we go on our way and instead of trembling in awe that the God of the universe would take on human flesh. That he would become one of us. Flesh and blood. They might destroy death and the one that had the power of death, the devil. That he might redeem us as our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. That he might be our brother. That he might manifest your love. And through that, manifest your grace to those who are lost. Taking our place. Dying for our sins rising from the dead and then giving not selling but giving out of love the gift of eternal life through faith in him Father how we thank you for Jesus how we thank you for Jesus in his precious name Amen our closing hymn for today is number 270, 270, Joy to the World.